Mm, hello, everybody. I hope everyone has eaten, eaten their breakfast. So uh, I will be speaking to you about how do you speed up your data processing by using parallel and asynchronous programming in the context of data science. So yeah, a bit about me. Uh, I am Chin Hui. So um, and my Chinese name is uh, Wang Jinghui. So I am a data engineer at ST Engineering, and I have a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. So, it, so um, because I'm a data engineer, and I use Pandas a lot, so I, I am a contributor to Pandas, and, 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 uh, and, and also in my free time, I am also active in the Singapore Token Tech community. Um, so I mentor, I am the, I mentor at Big Data X where we conduct data engineering workshops. But then due to COVID-19, I think everything physical has been cancelled in Singapore. So maybe next year. So uh, a, a typical data science workflow looks like this. So I extract the raw data and then I process the data. After the data is processed, then I use the data to train the model. And then after that, I evaluate, and then if everything looks fine, and I will just deploy the model. So it looks like it looks like a linear process. It looks simple, right? But the problem is that it's not so simple in real life because there are certain bottlenecks in a data science project. So one of the one of the biggest headaches that we have is that we sometimes we have lack of data. But if you have lack of data, then you can't do any data science. But what is more commonly Happen, that what is more common is the fact that the data may be of poor quality. So if we have poor quality data, we can't use, straight away use it to train our models. That's why we need to do some data processing. And that brings me to the often said 80 20 data science dilemma, whereby we typically say that in a data science process, it is usually 80% cleaning and processing and 20% analysis. However, in reality, this is not true. I will have to burst your bubble on that because it is actually closer to 90-10. 90% of the time is actually spent on data processing and only 10% of the time is used to get insights from your data. So in, in, in data science, uh, Python is a common used programming language due to its ease of use. So when we first learn Python, the first thing that we learn about is for loops. However, we need to keep in mind that for loops run on the Python interpreter and it's not compiled. And hence it is slow compared with C. So if you look at the code snippet, you see that for every iteration, I will have to append the output into a list. So is there a better way to do that? So that's why in Python, we have introduced the concept of list comprehensions, which is slightly faster than for loops. Why is it so? The main reason is because for list comprehensions, you do not need to call the append function at each iteration because it is already preloaded when you are constructing the list comprehension. But then, like for us, like data science, like those who are working in data science, the library that we mainly use is Pandas because it is optimized for in-memory analytics using data frames, whereby they have all those pre-built functions that are that make work, working with data frames easier. So all is good when we are working with like relatively smaller data sets, but when we are dealing with large data sets of at least one gigabyte, we run into performance and out-of-memory issues. So. When, when Pandas is good for most of the cases, but then if you're dealing with like hundreds and thousands of gigabytes, then maybe you might need to look at something else. So usually what we would think of is, why not just use a Spark cluster? Like Spark is, Spark is good for big data, right? It's big data. But then we need to think about whether it is practical for us to use a Spark cluster because a main, because a main overhead in using a Spark cluster is communication overhead. Because Spark cluster is distributed computing and distributed computing involves communicating between independent machines across a network. So what does this mean? It means that I will have the equivalent of like a few compute cluster, a few compute VMs that needs to communicate across each other. 
this. And then it's like, like in a, it's like in a mobile network whereby I am using a, I'm using a, like Line or WhatsApp, and then I need to send my message to another like another mobile. So there will be this communication overhead because I will have to commit. I will have to synchronize my messages. And on top of that, we also need to consider the problem of small big data. So what is small big data? So this is inspired by the Small Big Data Manifesto, which Itama Chandra Chowering actually gave a great talk about at PyCon 2020. So if you want to find out more about that, check out his talk. So what he means by what we mean by small big data is that it is data that is too big to fit in memory, but it is not large enough to justify using a Spark cluster due to the immense amount of communication overhead that is involved. So if we can't use Pandas, we can't use Spark, then what is the intermediate solution? So what? So this brings us to the problem of what is parallel processing? Okay, so I am someone who does not like to look at a whole long chunk of text to understand a concept. So yeah, let's imagine that I work at Kopitiam. So, okay, so some context, right? Kopitiam is like, uh, it's like you know, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, we have, um, it's like a typical place where right? you sit down there, have, have coffee, have breakfast. Yeah, so um, this is like a so it's typical, typical Nanyang breakfast. We have, we have coffee, egg, and toast. But because eggs are actually quite easy to, to deal with, so I should not talk about that. So let's deal with the coffee and the toast, which are more troublesome to deal with. Okay, so task one. I want to toast 100 slices of bread. Okay, so some assumptions uh, I'm going to make here is that first, I'm using single slice toasters. Two, each slice of toast takes two minutes to make. And three, let's assume that there's no overhead time. But in reality, we have to consider that there will always be overhead time. Okay, so um, when we talk about sequential processing, also known as, uh, like, you know, you're doing everything in sequence one by one. So I have 100 slices of bread. I feed them one by one into a toaster, which is actually a processor or a worker. And then after I toast those breads one by one, I get 100 slices of toast. So the execution time to, 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 to complete that would be about 200 minutes. So, I mean, if like, Singaporeans are very impatient, right? And then, and if you take 200 minutes to get 100 slices of toast, I think you'll be out of business. So, we need to have a better way of doing that. So, now, same thing, we have 100 slices of toast. We split them into four batches. We fit them into four toasters. So, all those total toasters are independent of each other. Which means that if one toaster fails, the other three can still work. So what actually happens in this step is that your task is executed using a pool of four toaster subprocessors. And each toaster subprocessor runs in parallel and independently from each other. And then after the toast, after we get the output from each toasting process, we consolidate the results and return it as an overall output. And because we don't really need to care about the order, so um, you need somebody to take into account that if you're doing parallel processing, you need, you need, you need, you can you cannot take, you cannot focus so much on whether your output is going to be ordered. And then with parallel processing, the execution time will be 50 minutes. And that that leads to that that leads to a speed up of four times. Look simple. Now let's look at what's the difference between synchronous versus asynchronous execution. So what do you mean by asynchronous? Well, let, me, let me give you another example. So task two will be that we're gonna brew coffee. So, and assu so some assumptions that I will make. One, I can do other stuff while making coffee. Two, one coffee maker to make one cup of coffee because now, yeah, coffee is not so easy to make, and you have to do you have to do so many things in this machine, and it's a bit new. So each cup of coffee will take five minutes to make. Okay, so if we're looking at synchronous execution, what we do is that 
we brew a cup of coffee on the coffee machine and then we toast two slices of bread on a single slice toaster after task two is completed. Why? Not? Because I mean, like in a typical Nayang breakfast, right? It's one coffee and two slices of toast. So that's why, uh, that's that's why you this will this will constitute one set, one breakfast set. And then you're out, and then the total education time to get this two toasts and one coffee is nine minutes. So imagine that I want to make hundred sets of breakfast. And I'm going to take 900 minutes. So 900 minutes is going to take like more than 15 hours. I think by that time, I, don't, I can close shop already. So we need an even better way to organize how we make our breakfast sets. So while we brew the coffee, why not we make some toast? So, for, so in the asynchronous, in asynchronous execution mode, the workflow will look like this. So while you're while you're making a while you are spending the time to make the coffee, you make two slices of toast, and the total execution time will be five minutes. So that so that will be about like a savings of about half. At least you will still be able to to at least you will still be able to make your sets in time. Okay, so it looks good, right? I'm getting a speed up with parallel with parallel execution. I'm getting I'm I'm doing more things at a time with a synchronous execution. So is it a good idea to simply just buy like 266 56 core processor and then just parallelize everything? Which brings me to the idea to, to the question of when is it a good idea to go for parallelism? So there's some practical considerations that we have to consider. So firstly, is your code already optimized? Because sometimes you might need to rethink your approach, like for example, using list comprehensions or map functions or some other built-in functions instead of four loops for array iterations. Second thing to consider is that like what is your what is the nature of a problem? Because which is also known as the problem architecture. Because how your problem is structured limits how successful parallelization can be. Because if your problem consists of processes which actually depend on each other's outputs, which is known as data dependency, then you're going to have some, you know, you're going to have to manage this dependency. Or your, or your problem may have intermediate results, like may, may depend on intermediate results, which is a matter of task dependency. So which means that you have to wait for the previous task to finish before you can go on to the next task. So in that case, maybe it's not so straightforward for you to just parallelize your codes. And last but not least, there will uh, there will, there's some over there also there's also overhead in parallelism. So this is not a problem that is unique to distributed computing. It still exists in parallelism, although of a slightly smaller scale, because of this law. There will always be parts of the work that cannot be parallelized. So this is known as Amdahl's law. So, and then you also need to consider the extra time that is required for coding and debugging. We, because, and this contributes to increased complexity. And on top of that, there is also the problem of system overhead, including communication overhead. So is parallelism such a good idea after all? So a bit about MDAL's law. So what exactly is MDAL's law? MDAL's law states that the theoretical speed up is actually defined by how much you can parallelize a code. So I'm not going to go through the details, but this is the result of MDAL's law. Because if you have no parallel parts, your speed up is zero. If all parts are parallel, then all is good. Then if I just add up the number, add up more processors, I'm going to get infinite speed up. But the problem is that the speed up is usually limited by a fraction of the work that is not parallelizable. And this will not improve even with infinite number of processors. So, I mean, that's the limitation of, of using parallel processing. So, and so let's go on to the concept of what is multi-processing versus multi-threading. So multi-processing is whereby the system allows executing multiple processes at the same time using multiple processors. So it's like I'm having like three coffee machines. And then multi-threading is whereby the system executes multiple threads of sub-processors at the same time within a single processor. So what it means is that 
the coffee machine itself, one unit of coffee machine may have multiple threads of sub-processes to execute the process. And so for multiprocessing, it is better for processing large volumes of data, especially for the computational operations. But for multi-threading, it is best suited for I.O. or blocking app operations, such as querying an API. But before we go into how we, ex how we implement parallel processing, we need, to cons we need to take into account some considerations. Data processing tends to be more compute intensive. And hence, the switching between threads actually become increasingly efficient, inefficient, as you are working on more compute intensive operations. On top of that, we also need to remember that the global interpreter lock, also known as the GIL in Python, does not allow parallel thread execution. So it will be some blocking and locking involved when you're trying to run parallel threading. So how do I do parallel versus asynchronous in Python in that case for data processing workflows? Especially because I don't really have like I don't really have a straightforward implementation from that, unlike using machine learning libraries. So, so one thing that we need, so it's not that it's not that complicated a problem because in, because in Python 3.2, there is this module called the concurrent of futures module, which is a high-level API for launching asynchronous parallel tasks. And it, and it is an abstraction layer over the multi-processing module such that it is easier for us to, 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 ru to run asynchronous parallel tasks. And there are two modes of execution. One will be the thread proof executor for asynchronous multi-threading. The second one will be the process pool executor for asynchronous multi-processing. So when we look at the Python standard library documentation, it talks about what's the difference between the process pool executor and the thread pool executor. So the main difference is that process pool executor actually sets a chunk size to a positive integer, which actually which does the chunking to different process processes. So um, when we look back at like what's the difference between multi-processing and multi and multi-threading, so you can apply that for the for the process pool executor and the thread pool executor. And the third, so process pool executor uses the multi processing module. As it's like as it's called, and it sidesteps the GIL. However, for the thread pool executor, it is still subject to GIL and it's not truly concurrent, as the module suggests. And then some some, some important operators is that is the submit in concurrent futures, which takes as input a callable and input arguments for the function and returns a futures object that represents the execution of that function. And another from another operation that is more familiar and, and similar to the built-in function map is the executor.map in concurrent futures. It takes as input a callable and a list and returns an iterator that yields the results of a function being applied to every element of the list. So, um, now, so now that I've talked about what is concurrent.futures module, let's, let's look at some use cases. So, one of the cases is uh, for a network I/O operation, whereby I would like to query data from an API. So in this case, I'm using. I'm, in this case, the response that I'm expecting is a JSON format. So first, uh, as usual, I will initialize my Python modules, initialize API request tasks, and in this case, I am using the threading module to monitor my thread execution to see whether the thread multi-threading actually works. And then, um, so we initialize the submission list to initialize our job. And, and then we do, and then we use list comprehension. Okay, so first I try using list comprehensions. Mm, wow, well, it's about 16.3 minutes, not too bad. But if I use the thread pool executor, I'm getting a 20.9 times speed up with 40 threads. So it takes only 46.83 seconds. So imagine from 16.5 minutes to 46.83 seconds. And if you look at the code, it is just a few, adding a few lines to it. Yeah. Okay. So second case would be in the case of image processing, whereby I have some chest X-ray images that I would like to process. And I have about 1.15 gigabyte of X-ray image data. 
And then the problem that I face is that the images in the data set are, are of different dimensions. So, I mean, before we have to feed, before we can feed our images into our model, we need to have the same dimensions. So we need to standardize the dimensions. So as usual, I will initialize the Python modules, initialize my image resize process. And in this case, to keep track of the process execution, I use os.getPID. And then I and then I try out the image processing on one on the training set for the normal class, which contains 1,431 images. And then so some of those, so I try to use building functions. So let's say, let's use a map function, map the map the function, so map the image with a function and then get and then collect the output. So with a map function, I take 29.48 seconds to process about 1,400 images, not too bad. If I use these comprehensions, I take about around the same time as using map, which is about 29.71 seconds. But if I use the process pool executor, and if, if we take note of how I write the how I write the code, it is very similar to how I write the code for the map function. This so if I run this on an eight core compute, it goes from about twenty nine seconds to less than seven seconds, which is a four point three times speed up. So you can see that. Like eight cores doesn't really equate to an eight times speed up, but still the speed up is substantial. Okay, so some key takeaways from this talk is that not all processes should be parallelized because parallel processes come with overheads. For one thing, we will have to consider the MDOS law on parallelism. Secondly, we will have to consider the system overhead, including communication overhead. And last but not least, if the cost of rewriting your code for parallelization actually outweighs the time savings from parallelizing your code, maybe we should consider other ways of optimizing your code instead, such as built-in functions, using, using, pen, using other libraries such as Pandas, or maybe even Dask, or maybe you need to maybe we need to think of how to not rely so much on for loops. So if there's, if there's one key takeaway on top of all these key takeaways that I would like you to take of you is that if your process is slow, try to eliminate your for loops. Rely on built-in functions before you think about using parallel processing for to speed up your operations. Okay, so yeah, okay, so yeah, can reach out to me at all these social media platforms and I will be uploading the data slides on my GitHub repo. Thank you. Hey. Thanks for watching. Do have any question? Okay, thanks for Wang Jinghui. Hey, hi. Hello, hi, hi Jinghui, can you hear me? Uh, I have a question about the multi-processor. Uh, you said that you, you can step away from the uh, G, uh, Python in lock, global lock. And it, mean, it means that we have to allocate another memory to when we want to use the same uh, data. Is it? Uh, 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 yes, yes, I mean, uh, if we want to use the same data uh, with multi process, uh, should we have to allocate another copy in memory to use it? Mm. Okay, uh, so what's, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 mm, I'm I didn't hear you clearly. So, are you talking about, uh, like, so how, how, how um, to, uh, how the multi process avoid the uh, G, G 
G A 呃 Glow 呃 Python G G I L in Python。So how、oh. how the okay? So you're talking about the G I L? Yeah. Okay. So um, you're talking about the G I L, right? So a G I L is this the global integrator lock that. Actually, locks the thread such that because because it is a consideration that you don't really want to end up like just wrongly modifying something unintentionally. But then, okay, so this thing about the GIL is that you no, know, you can't exactly run thread processes in parallel such that it will change the same thing. But then, how they actually try to go about the multi-threading is probably to manage how the processes are actually running on each thread. So it's a bit of like interlocking. But then, I mean, the details-wise of the GIL is something that I think、um, it's something that I will want to look further into.、Yeah. So the the main difference between multi-processing and multi-threading is is how it it can. Prevent from the and prevent the suffering from G GIL. Is it is is that correct? 哎，怎么听不到？哎、uh, ，有。呃，他没听到。嗯，我没听到。哦、oh, ，So, uh, 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 another question is the main difference between multi-processor and multi-threading. Is a multi-processor can pre prevent the suffering from GIL? Is it correct? Can I explain that? Okay. So for multi-processing, right? It is running multiple processors on different cores in your compute. So for example, right? It's like I'm using my laptop. It has eight cores. And then I try to run a process, a data, a a process, and I try to run a process to run on eight cores. So what these eight cores do is that they are running a subset of the process that I'm trying to run. All eight of them are independent from each other. All eight of them will have their own threads. So that is how multi-processing works. So that's why it. This it can sidestep the GIL in a way, but then for multi-threading, you are looking at trying to run multi run operations in multiple threads within a core. So because the problem is with the because of the、G uh, constraints that the, that the GIL imposes on running like running parallel threads concurrently in a core. So that's why, like for multi-threading, there will need to be a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of how the design for a parallel execution. Hence, there's that has probably there's a need for like some a some like asynchronous operation asynchronous execution to be able to execute to be able to run like multi-threads. So at least that's my understanding based on what I see in their documentation. But then I think it's some. But then, but then, like I, I so far I have looked through like the base documentation. But then, to be able to understand like what exactly do they do to to perform the multi trading, that will require. I think that's a that's a very good question, and that's something that I'll probably want to take a look at, take a closer look at. Okay, thanks for Huang Jinghui. 那下一场开始的时间是十一点五十五分，那谢谢大家。